Hi, good afternoon. I thought I was going to say good morning, but it's going to be... <laughs> sorry, sorry about the, the delay. Sorry that we're delaying your lunch. Um, how are you enjoying the day? My, my name is Jesus Barraza. Um, I work for Neo Technology. And today, uh, for the next half hour, I want to talk about one of the, one of the most interesting, I think, uh, uh, use cases, which is, which is fraud, fraud analysis, fraud detection, prevention. Uh, th that's the story. But my, my real objective of this uh, is that by the time we break for lunch, you leave with two ideas. One of them is graph thinking, and the other one is graph native. Bear with me. I'll try to explain both, and I'll check at the end if I've been successful at passing the message. So, there's Panama Papers in the title, so I'll start by that. One year ago, in the room next to us, there was uh, Mar Cabra from the ICAJ, and she was announcing uh, that they were making public, publicly available the data set that they had been using for their investigation, the Panama Papers. And, and they, were they were not making it available as, as, a, as a set of files or as a data, relational database dump. They were making it public as a as a graph, as a graph database. And that's because the whole investigation had taken place, as Emil has explained, and many other people during the last year, uh, by exploring data in a graph. So she explained how they got this uh, leak, what was the shape of that leak, I mean, how many scanned documents, how many emails, how many uh, database dumps, and how they applied all sort of OCR techniques to extract information out of these entity extraction, metadata extraction, at some point they decided we're going to put all that in a graph. And that was a game-changing decision because by doing that, they, they made it possible for the less tech-savvy uh, journalists to do very basic uh, searches for a public figure, finding a node that was representing that public person in the graph, and then from there they were just clicking, exploring manually, and finding some expected, some unexpected connections, and writing stories out of it. And, and that was huge, uh, because also the more technical, uh, capable guys could do something more advanced, like running queries, identifying patterns, finding you know, shortest path between elements. So it opened a number of possibilities. And, and what did we learn from that? Well, as citizens, of course, we learned that it's very important to bring transparency to this you know, dark world of, of offshore finance. But from a technical point of view, we we saw obviously that there's, there's a lot of value in looking at data as a graph. And, and I'm going to show that to you with a, with a very little example that makes it very, very obvious. So we have all been you know, exposed to a, a horrible spreadsheet like this one, right? In this particular case, it's a simple data set where we have you know, emails being sent between people. Who sends it? Who receives it? Timestamp, size, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll have tabular data. The typical thing that we'll do is we'll build pie charts, histograms, we'll do the standard analysis that we've been doing for so many years. But now what I going to ask you to do is to swap your glasses, put your graph thinking glasses on, and let's look exactly at the same data set, but now as a graph. And well, suddenly the data starts talking to us. We start seeing patterns that are emerging from the data. We suddenly see something that we couldn't see, the fact that there's two disjoint communities, that one of them is a centralized community where all communication goes through a central node, that in the other one there's like two subgroups that are connected through two individuals. There's lots of insight coming just from looking at data as a graph. Right, so, and of course, in the case of the Panama Papers guys, well, that led to arrests, to resignations from prime ministers. You've all heard that from, from Emil and, and, and many others, as I say. So, but then the question is, say, that people will tell, well, that's great, but I'm, you know, I'm in finance, so I'm in insurance. Do I have a graph problem? Because I don't have people connected to people. Or, yeah, that can be a part of it. You know, social network analysis is a part of fraud analysis, but you know, I struggle to find it. And what we have is, it, is a problem, and is this, this thing that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we've been doing relational, we've been thinking tabular, we've been thinking in sets for so long that we tend to think of data as data sets. And that works in some cases, but we're missing some other very interesting, uh, um, some other approaches, right? So let me flip, flip the question, and, and again, that was, that's gonna be something that you, you've heard a, a number of times. Did Google have a, a graph problem back at the beginning of the century when they were competing with, with the rest of the search engines? They were crawling the web, they were, uh, they were um, uh, indexing, and, and then the, the, the competition, the, 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 what was gonna determine who was the, the winner was who was gonna return the most relevant results, okay? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a 
information retrieval problem. So there's a number of ways in which you can determine this document is relevant to your search or not. But what the guys did is, we're not going to do discrete analysis. We're not going to look at documents because we're not talking, we're not looking at documents. We're looking at connected documents. And the web is you know, documents connected, pages connected through hyperlinks. And you know the story, they said, what if the relevance of a page, what, what if the authority of a page was determined by the fact that other pages pointed it? And then if you become a relevant page, if you point at another one, you propagate that relevance. And that's the, that's the root of the, of the page rank algorithms that, that make Google what they are. So, so they just looked at the problem from a different angle. They look at it as a graph, and they became leaders in their market. So what I would say is, don't ask yourself if you, I'm, I'm tweaking this, this JFK uh, uh, quote that you might be familiar with. Don't ask yourself if you have a graph problem. Try to look at it from a different angle. Try to put your glasses, the graph thinking glasses on. That's first, first concept, graph thinking. And I'm going to take you now through an example that you may not think, I mean, it's one possible uh, fraud analysis that you may not think as a graph problem, but I'm going to show you that if you look at it as a graph, you're going to be able to extract incredible value. So think about your problem with this, with this mindset. What's the example? Well, it's about um, credit card fraud, right? And one of the many things that you will do when you detect fraud is try to determine what's, what's the origin of that fraud. Where does it come from? And one of the problems is skimming, right? The story starts with a bad guy uh, installing some um, skimming device as a cash point or a rogue merchant having a, a, a pay, uh, payment device with a skimming element. So what happens is that you know, a few weeks later, we're at the call center of a credit card company, and we get a call from Sheila telling us, hey, I've just got this message on my uh, telephone of this transaction at a computer store that I didn't make. That's not me. So my card has been you know, skimmed, probably. Something has gone wrong, because that transaction is not, is not genuine. So we mark it as fraudulent. And there's a number of analyses that start. We'll look at the patterns of, of, the, of usage of the card. But one of the things we'll do is try to look at the history and what's been going on and what can be the cause of, of the, the origin of this, of this problem. And while we start, uh, we, we're thinking uh, about that, we get uh, Mark calling us with a similar problem. You know, I'm in trouble you know, because the, this, this payment at this jewelry store, it wasn't me. So again, we tag the transaction as fraudulent and we continue investigating. And one of the things we'll do, and we'll get out data scientists, our, our, our data managing, our data fraud analysts team, is to look at, is there a way to try to trace these uh, transactions, the, the history of usage of these cards to a point where they all converge, where there's a potential uh, uh, cause, a potential uh, fraud origin, and then we'll get another call, and, and the more symptoms we get, the more likely are we to try, I mean, to, 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 to identify these, these, these originating points. So what we want to do, and what one of our analysts will come, uh, will come with in a, in, in a few hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, is that, hey, I found that they all went to, to this uh, dodgy petrol station in the middle of nowhere. They took cash from there, and that could be a, a, a potential explanation for that. So what we'll do immediately is say, well, who else was there at the same time, uh, at the same time window? Which other cards were used there? And we find Robert, who hasn't called us yet, but who might call us uh, in the near future, so what we're gonna do is, well, we're gonna block his card, send him a new one, and tell him your card might have been compromised, so we have take this measure to protect you from, from this possibility. So this is an analysis that can take many hours. We're talking about huge amount of data. I've simplified this to an example, but what I'm going to do is model this as a graph, and here's my, my graph model. I hope it's, well, it's not readable. At least I'm going to try to explain. We have horizontal lines, the horizontal lines are sequences, sequence of transactions for a given card. So what we have is a chronological sequence of transactions. It's the usage of, of a card. Each one is a transaction, a payment. And every transaction will be associated to a terminal, the terminal where it takes place, whether it's a, a, a virtual one because it's an on, online payment, if it's a cash point, if it's a pay machine, whatever. There will always be a terminal. And a terminal will, be, will belong to a, to a merchant, right? So the model couldn't be simpler. So we have chains, chronological chains of transactions for a given card, right? Who will converge at certain points in time at terminals because that's the point of terminals. Many people use them, right? That's my model, right? 
So I'm going to show what it looks like, just for the beauty of it. It's not the kind of model that you would explore. Nothing to do with the Panama Papers. Here we're looking at a completely uh, the other end of the spectrum. So we're with a very, very dynamic data set. So we're getting transactions as they arrive. So our graph, these chains of transactions are growing by the second. And we're getting calls informing us of the fact that there's fraud. So at the same time, we're getting a flow of, of, um, of events telling us that fraud is happening. So how do I build this graph? I'm gonna show a bit of code. It's just, uh, I thought it was interesting because what I'm going to show you is, is, is actually real code that I've run. I'm going to take you through it. Don't worry too much if you're not familiar with Cypher. But the idea is very simple. How do I build that graph? So as I get transactions, a transaction will look something like that. So it will be a, a pack of data containing the amount, the, 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 the currency, the timestamp, the ID of the terminal, the ID of the merchant. Well, if you're in that space, you will be familiar with all these elements. And all I have to do is, well, identify the card that was used for the payment. And I'll find what's the last transaction that I'm aware of for this card. And I find it by just doing a fast lookup by card ID. And I find the last one because I know it doesn't have a next transaction, because it's the first in the queue, the first in the list. So once I found it, I create a new transaction with the information that I'm receiving, and I add it to the chain. I put it on, at, the, at the front of the chain. This is assuming that the data arrives in sequence. If it doesn't, you would look at the timestamp. So it's, in any case, a very simple operation. And we also will connect it to the terminal where it takes place. I will find the terminal. It will typically be in my database, because someone has used it before. And I'll link my new transaction to the terminal. OK, so what I'm doing is I'm building something like that, a beautiful chain of transactions. Transactions are connected to terminals. And terminals will be connected to merchants, which I'm not showing here for, for simplicity. And at the same time, I'm getting people calling me and informing me of potentially fraudulent transactions. And that's much simpler. They will give me probably a card ID, a card number, and a timestamp, and I will identify which is the transaction that I want to flag as fraudulent. Again, very similar to what we did before. We have probably an ID of the transaction, and all I have to do is look it up in my database and mark it as fraudulent. So what I'm doing is painting the transaction red, if we want to see it visually. Okay, and that's happening over time. I keep getting transaction and keep get being alerted of fraud. So my graph is growing. This is a completely dynamic operation. And every time I get a fraud, I want to trigger again this analysis. Let's look at all the history for that particular card. Let's look back in time. Let's look at all the fraud cases. And let's see if they converge at some point. So I'm exploring a graph. If some of you here are in the telecom space, that's what we're looking at is root cause analysis. What happens when we have a network and we start getting symptoms? Customers complaining about things failing. It's not a local problem. Probably they have some common cause, and we will have to explore the topology to find what's the potential root cause. So that's what we're going to do. And one more query, very quickly. Just uh, the top part is important one. What I'll do is I'll look for this pattern. I look for a fraud. Start from the fraud and go back in the history of transactions. And for every transaction, I'm going to look at the terminal where it took place. And I aggregate. Is there any intersection? Is there any convergence of, of chains of transaction into a particular point? Well, I just aggregate and count. This second part will just count and present results like that. So I will get a list of terminals where a percentage, a relevant percentage of cases ultimately end in fraud and a time window, right? So if I say that 5% of the fraud cases that I'm aware of at the moment pass through that uh, terminal, but they did it in a space of 21 days, that's maybe not that relevant because, you know, over time, everyone will, well, not everyone, but a significant number of users will. But if it happens in a space of three days, maybe something's going on there. 10% of the cards that were used on that terminal ultimately have been reported as fraudulent, and that happened in a space of three days. So something was going on there. So what I can do is, well, define certain thresholds and say, well, if the percentage goes above a certain uh, uh, given number, and the time window is less than 72 hours, let's say, that's a high, a high chance that there's, a, there's something going on there. And what I'll do is what I described before. I'm going to say who else used that terminal in that time window because I want to block these cards and issue new ones because otherwise they're going to be the victim of fraud in the near future. And that's the, that's the last query. So I agree with that. So once I have a terminal in a time, in a time window, all I have to do is find all the transactions all the cards that were used on that terminal in that particular time window. And I just get a list of cards, and I can automate that process. 
and as I say, notify them your card has been compromised and we've decided to, to block it to prevent you from being the victim of fraud. And we're a champion, they're happy with that. Now let's look at it from the point of view of the performance. So what I did is I started with a, with a small data set, just a million transactions, and I run this query. The query that you saw is this fraud origination uh, at the terminal level, and that was taking 93 milliseconds. I'm not, I care more about the, rel the, the relative numbers than the absolute, the query could be optimized. But what I mean is it is a real time query. So every time you get fraud, you can afford to run this exercise and see if, if this new symptom, this new fraud, can in combination with the ones that I'm aware of, detect or, or, or bring, bring to light something potentially uh, relevant like the fact that uh, uh, a terminal has been compromised. I've run it also at the, at the merchant level because sometimes if the fraudulent, uh, uh, if the fraud comes from the merchant, they may not all converge at the same terminal. A merchant may have three terminals and then it's, it's, it's even harder to identify. But it, from the point of view of the graph, it's just one more hop in my traversal. So I haven't shown you that query because I thought it was enough cipher. But if I do that, that was taking 102 milliseconds. Still real time, uh, real time um, uh, queries. And then once I've identified a, a, a potentially fraudulent terminal, identifying which are the, the, the cards at risk to carry out some proactive prevention uh, action, that was 11 milliseconds. So that, that was, and now comes the second idea. I've talked about graph thinking. I've shown you how we can look at a problem that it's not obviously a graph problem as a graph to get obvious benefits. And the second idea is graph native. So what, hap what, what does it mean? Well, again, it has been mentioned before and you probably will hear it again today. Neo4j stores the data uh, in a native way. That means we persist the pointers. I mean, every connection between a transaction and the previous one, every connection between a transaction and the terminal where it took place is persisted in disk, right? That makes it possible when I traverse to be independent of indexes. I don't need to scan an index to see what's going on. I don't need to run aggregates. What I'm doing is jumping, following pointers. And that's something that computers do at an incredible speed and, and, and super efficiently. That's one thing. The other thing is they can do it in a predictable manner. I'm not affected by the fact that my database doubles in size because I'm only affected by the portion of the graph that I explore. So what I did is, that's what happens with a million transactions. What if I take half a billion? I make it 500 times bigger. Again, I, I'm aware it's a small, it's not that small because the number of credit card transactions in, in, in the UK in a month is 1.5 billion. So it's like a third of the transactions that, that take place in, in, in a country like, like the UK. And, um, and that's running in my laptop. So I'm not using any, any you know, fancy uh, machine or anything. So I took that data set, made it 500, 500 times bigger, half a billion. And I said, what's gonna be the performance? There we go. So 500 times bigger, but the performance, I mean, I'm not afraid to say that that's constant. I mean, the increase is, is ridiculous. What does that mean? Well, it means that this kind of analysis can be run in real time and reacting as soon as possible to these sort of problems, it's obvious that it saves money. So second idea, graph native. Predictability in the performance and of course, incredible speed. Right, so that was the second idea. Because I'm taking time from your lunch, I think I'm going to break here. Just let me take back to the, to the, to the beginning. Two, I'm going to say three, but graph thinking. Look at your graph, look at your problem with a different mindset, look at it, trying to find a graph in it. And second, remember that graph native matters. And the third one, well, just have fun, enjoy the rest of the day, and thanks for your attention.